Okay, so uh, we're continuing on in this chapter. We have already talked about regular bacteria or U bacteria, which is the true bacteria, which inhabits almost every environment except for the extreme environments, which is where we will find archaea bacteria uh, or the domain archaea, which the kingdom archaea bacteria falls into. Um, archaea bacteria and you bacteria at one point were in one kingdom. Do you remember the name of that kingdom? Monera, yes. And as they were in that kingdom, Monera, scientists were classifying and realized there's, a, there's differences between different prokaryotes. And so with a little bit of time and further molecular study, and what are we studying when we're studying molecular? DNA, fantastic. We realize that there are some significant differences, so much so that we can put them in their own domain. So archaea bacteria, there, again, there's three domains, the eubacteria, archaea, or yeah, eubacteria, archaea, and eukarya. The eubacteria, the ones that we d discussed last week, archaea are kind of like a segue between regular bacteria and eukaryotes. So they have some features that are like bacteria, some features that are like eukaryotes, and then they have some other distinguishing features, which we'll discuss today. So um, molecularly, when we go to classify them, they still are prokaryotes, which makes them bacteria. However, they are more genetically similar to eukaryotes. So it's just one of those unique situations. However, they are still prokaryotes. They have one circular chromosome. Okay, and we talked about the um, characteristics of prokaryotes in our last lecture. When we talk about the unique characteristics that these archaea bacteria have, and this is different groups of them, this is not all of them, but some of them are what we call, well, overall we call them extremophiles, not some of them. Overall we call them extremophiles because we will only find archaea bacteria in extreme environments. Environments that are so extreme that not other types of uh, forms of life can exist so that there's no competition or um, chance for d damage or danger or death. So it talks about them being found in hot springs, hydrothermal vents, and the Great Salt Lakes. And we're going to go through each one. But methanogens, halophils, and thermoacidophils. These are three groups of RK bacteria, which all fall into extremophils. Bless you. Beginning, oh, wait. Here's methanogens. Let me, let me go back because I do want to talk about why they can be in extreme environments. And if you were with me in 06, you already know this. But do you remember what Graham staining tests for? Peptidoglycan. Peptidoglycan. Graham staining tests for peptidoglycan. It is a carbohydrate found in the cell wall of U bacteria. Guess what RK bacteria don't have? Peptidoglycan. And when I initially taught on peptidoglycan, I said it's kind of like football pads and it really keeps them protected and robust in a natural environment. Peptidoglycan does. But if you're lacking peptidoglycan, you're lacking that protection. So you need to be in extreme environments where not, nothing can harm you or, or you're not at risk. Okay? So their cell walls, it says some distinct molecules similar to peptidoglycan. Do RK bacteria have peptidoglycan? They do not. But it also talks about their cell membrane, and that's what allows them to be, to withstand these extreme environments, is their cell membrane has unusual lipid molecules. Okay. We're not going to talk about the, the molecular foundation of those lipid molecules, but what are the lipid molecules that we find in everything else? phospholipids, phospholipids. And at that, it's a phospholipid bilayer, remember, because they're trying to protect one another. But in these RK bacteria, they are lacking peptidoglycan, making them more vulnerable. However, in their plasma membrane, they have these unusual lipid molecules that make them more resistant to extremes. So they can tolerate extreme environments, whereas other forms of life cannot. Go ahead. 
so there, it's not like ours, no. They have a lipid layer, but it's not necessarily a phospholipid bilayer like we have discussed. So, methanogens. Methanogens are named after the fact that they can withstand methane. Guess what a lot of living organisms cannot withstand or tolerate? High levels of methane. So this works well for them. It says that they, are li they live in reducing environments and they are obligate anaerobes, meaning they not only do they not need air, but air is toxic to them. And that's a term we discussed in our last lecture, obligate anaerobes. So areas where we will find them in swamps, lakes, and marshes, but where water is not moving or flowing. Because if water's moving or flowing, there's oxygen. So this is where stuff has died and sunk down, and it's forming like these sediments, and it's real thick and, and even thicker than soup, like mushiness. Okay, so like dead stuff has floated down there, it's breaking down. Leaf matter, algae, all that stuff is floating down to the bottom. So there's not a lot of oxygen, or there can't be any for that bacteria, but there's just not a lot of movement. It says the rumen of cattle, sheep, and camels. What's a rumen? It's not a carcass. Cut is found, it goes through the rumen. A rumen is when um, these organisms that are herbivores, remember they swallow their food and then they regurgitate it. So they have, like they say, oh, they have four stomachs. That area, we call that the rumen, okay? So that's unique to those animals that chew their food, swallow it, and it sits in the first one, and then they regurgitate it, chew it again. So regurgitate means that they threw it up, they chew it again, and they swallow it, goes to the second stomach, her rumen is how that works. So we have a lot of archaeobacteria in there because there's no oxygen, okay? There's a lot of methane. In fact, studies show that the ruminant animals um, provide a lot of methane in our atmosphere by their gas. So, um, yeah. So... <laughs> That, that could be a, one of those large contributing factors. So as far as the methane that we find in our atmosphere, a large proportion of it comes from cattle and other ruminant animals who continue to poop and fart uncontrollably. We also have archaea bacteria that inhabit our gut. The acid levels are really, really low, and it helps to break down certain aspects, but it also releases methane as its byproduct. So what does that cause us to do? Fart. Yes. And when do you fart the most after you eat what? Plant-based foods that we cannot digest. So it makes sense. Like all of a sudden you're like, what? Yeah. Okay. And then the hind guts of insects like termites and such. Did you have a question, Dorian? I don't know if, if you did or if, okay. Sorry. I felt like you did. Halophils. Or halophils. These are found in extremely salty environments and not like the ocean because that's not extremely salty. Although that's salty, it's roughly 3% salt concentration. The Great Salt Lakes have a huge concentration of salt, so much so that it would take just a very short time for you and I to be immersed in it to dehydrate. It would completely pull the water out of our body and we would dehydrate and, and we would expire. It would be toxic for us for sure. Um, it mentions that these halophils, they love salt, so that's a good thing. But they're aerobic chemoheterotrophs. What does that mean to you? They need oxygen. And they use chemicals to eat their food, to get the energy to eat their food. Yes. Okay, so that's an extreme condition we won't find much life in. Then thermophils or thermoacidophils. If it's thermophils, what are they able to withstand? Temperature. So thermo in their temperature. But what about acido? 
acids, uh, extremely acidic environments. And so I feel like you can dissect those words and kind of figure out what it's trying to say. So live in extremely hot environments, examples like the hydrothermal vents. We discussed this last week, but again, where are hydrothermal vents? Bottom of the ocean, they're the volcanoes at the core, the very bottom of the ocean, okay? And when they erupt, they cause the shifting of plate tectonics, and then we have the tsunamis and all these storms that come along with it. It's a big deal. It's a big deal, okay? And it mentions that they're both obligate or facultative anaerobes. What's the difference between those two? Where's obligate? Oxygen is toxic. What does facultative mean? Facultative. They can be, they can use fermentation. What else does that mean? If oxygen's present, it will use oxygen. If oxygen is not present, it'll go through fermentation. And we talked about or discussed last week the difference in ATP synthesis. Oxygenated ATP synthesis, we get a lot of ATP. When we don't have oxygen, we get just a little bit, right? We were, we were using 36 to 38 and 2 as our reference numbers. Okay, so that's it for archaeobacteria. The rest of this lecture deals with viruses, virons, and prions, or viroids and prions. You'll hear it, virons and viroids. But anyway, proceed to your quick question. Uri archaeota. Yeah, and that's just, that's just a connection between the archaeobacteria and, the, yeah, that bridge, that name. Yes, great question. Yuri Archeota. Okay, so um, viruses, the big thing that I pointed out at the beginning of this section, first of all, the title of this chapter does not have viruses in it. This, I'm not sure if it was originally designed with viruses, but it is in here. It's the third and final section of this chapter. Viruses in no way, shape, or form are living. The only way viruses can continue to propagate is if they infect a host. One of the characteristics of all living organisms is their ability to reproduce. Living organisms can reproduce. Guess what viruses cannot do on their own? Reproduce. And that's why they use a host. So a virus will invade a host and use that host to have babies, to make copies of itself. But if you put virus here on the table, it can't propagate on its own. It has to infect a host in order to keep going, okay? So there's no living aspect to viruses. We discussed also that it is inappropriate to use antibiotics on viruses because antibio means anti-life. And since viruses are not alive, antibiotics won't work. However, what do viruses use us for again? Reproduction. So for those of you who are going further into science and medicine and so on, your goal with viruses is not to kill them, but to keep them from reproducing. And the name of that term, and it's not brought up in this lecture, but this is just for those of you moving forward, it's called an interferon because it interferes with reproduction. Interferon interferes with reproduction. So if you have a virus and it's already hijacked you and it's using you, your body will eventually start to metabolize it depending on the severity of that virus. So no antibiotic will work, and interferon won't work either. But Tamiflu is an interferon. So if you know that you have the flu virus the first or second day of infection, you can take interferon early and keep that virus from doing what? Reproducing. So you don't get the full-blown flu. You recover in a shorter time frame. Okay, 
But if you're already day seven into your flu, Tamiflu is not going to do anything for you. Okay? So um, we have different types of viruses. Some viruses infect bacteria, which is where we'll spend the most majority of our lecture. Um, some of them infect animals and plant cells. Viruses are very specific, though. I do want to point that out and make sure that you understand that. Viruses are very specific, which means if I'm a plant virus, I'm going to infect a plant. A plant virus is not going to infect a human. A plant virus is not going to infect a human. However, as a human, if I eat a plant that has a virus, it could upset my stomach and maybe give me diarrhea, but I'm not going to get the plant virus because I'm not a plant. I don't have plant cells. Okay? So viruses are very specific to the type of cell that they infect. We already discussed that antibiotics don't work, and those antivirals are interferon. They interfere with the reproduction. All right? Um, we're going to talk about the evolution of viruses and how we think they got started, hypothesized at least, and then viroids and prions. We'll talk about them last. So viruses are a non-living infective agent with no met metabolic system of their own. So hence the need for a host. Hence the need for a host. Okay? Um, they rely on the host organism, most of them for nourishment, um, to, to continue to get the energy, and for reproductive purposes. When we look at a virus, there are two main aspects. The first is that it has some type of nucleic acid. What is that? Genetic material. It has some type of nucleic acid, but only a fragment of it. So it has a fragment of nucleic acid. And when I say some type, it could be DNA or RNA. Okay, and I'll kind of expound upon that in a moment. And the second aspect is most viruses have what we call a protein coat. A protein coat or a capsid. Okay, a protein coat or a capsid. So they have their viron particle, which is their fragment of genetic material, whether it's DNA or RNA, and they have a protein coat. And I like to reference that protein coat to a Halloween costume. Because, guess, do you have nucleic acids in your body? Yeah. Do you have proteins in your body? Yeah. So when I have this viral nucleic acid, because that's where the message is, and it's surrounded by a protein coat, and it comes and knocks on my cell's wall, or cell's door, there's no wall. Cell's door, my cell says, hello? And it's like, hey, it's me. I'm in my protein coat, like it's a Halloween party. Like, we're all costumed up. And my cells are like, oh yeah, well you're protein. I'm protein. Whatever you hang it hang out, they allow that virus in the cell, and then what does that virus do? Wipes out everything. That protein coat acts like what I think is like a Halloween costume. Like it kind of makes your body feel like it fits in, and it kind of mingles for a minute, and then all of a sudden it's like, whoa, I gotcha. <laughs> Shame on you for being so friendly. Okay, so it's got a genetic message. Um, fragment of some type, DNA, RNA, and it's enclosed by a protein coat. The term bacteriophage. Bacteriophage is the name of a virus that infects a bacteria, period. The name of a virus that infects a bacteria. Bacteriophage. The name of a virus that infects a bacteria. Could you be infected with a bacteriophage? Could a bacteriophage impact you? Yes, it could. How come? Bacteria lives in our body, and if that virus infects that bacteria, the bacteria that we have a symbiotic relationship with becomes disrupted, and because we're dependent upon that 
symbiotic relationship, we also become disrupted, okay? Which is when you get your stomach viruses and stuff like that. So if you can't really control. Here, are, here is a list out of the text of different viruses, um, you know, like chicken pox, all of that. It, the, what this is telling you is where it is as far as viruses are concerned, how we classify them in their family, whether or not there's an envelope present, and we'll talk about what an envelope is shortly, the nucleic acid that it, looks, that it contains. It says, like right here, single strand of RNA, single strand of RNA, a double strand of DNA, single strand of RNA. So that's what the SS and DS means, single-stranded, double-stranded, because you could have double-stranded RNA or single-stranded DNA because it's a virus, and it's just fragments of genetic material, okay? So it doesn't necessarily have to follow the living rules in order to function as a virus. As far as the viral structure, and I already mentioned this, but here it is all spelled out. So the viral genome, and what does genome mean again? DNA. Remember, genes, genome, genetic material, molecular data, all, that's all DNA. That's all DNA. It could be DNA or RNA. It could be double-stranded or single-stranded. could be double-stranded RNA or single-stranded DNA. It might have just a couple genes. It may have 100 genes. It just depends on how much genetic material is present. Okay? That coat that I spoke of, that capsid, that protein coat, is made up of a single type of protein for some of them, and some of them are made up of different groups of proteins. But look at what it says at the bottom. It includes recognition proteins. What do you think a recognition protein is responsible for? Trick, it ultimately tricks your cell, because what does it say? <laughs> we look the same. Like, I'm a protein, you're a protein. We both do the same. Why are you rejecting me? No, I belong inside of you. And then your cells are like, oh, man, I'm sorry. It's just been a hard week or a bad day. Go ahead and come in. It's like that South Park episode. That what? It's like when Buddy kissed a girl. Yeah, see, I, you said South Park, and my husband watches South Park. But the first time I watched South Park, I was like, I feel like I'm getting... Stupid watching this. <laughs> and he's like, why do you got to be like that? Like, I could not watch that Napoleon Dynamite movie. It was like 10 minutes in. I was like, no. And they're like, this is so funny. And I'm like, ah, oh, where he must, it's just not. So I, ha I know South Park what you speak of, but I do not know of what episode you're, you're, you're speaking on. So I apologize. But if he dressed up as a girl and they let him in, it's very similar to that, yes. <laughs> Here's an example of the TMV virus, tobacco mosaic virus. This virus is specific to plants. Um, so it's just kind of giving you the structure. And one of my favorite classes, especially those of you who are going further in science, was virology. So I'm going to kind of just touch base today and give you an idea of how viruses work. But... When you grow up, if you're going to stay in a biology major or something like that, you're going to take a class called virology, and all of this stuff is going to go into much deeper details. But the tobacco, tobacco mosaic virus, some key characteristics of it are the fact that it has RNA as its genetic material, and then the shape. This shape is what we call a helical shape. So tobacco mosaic virus is a helical shape virus um, with RNA as its genetic material. It is a plant virus, so plants get it and infects plants, and plants can die from it. If the plants are within the vicinity of one another, the virus can jump from plant to plant so it can spread, just like other viruses have that ability to do. Um, but that's just an example of a plant-specific virus and giving you the shape there as well. Yes, ma'am. No, it's just the name of that virus. Great question. Great question. Sometimes the viruses will be very specific, but um, like that'll get us in a whole other lecture. 
I was going to talk about the flu for a minute, but there's too many versions of flu and, and AIDS and all of that. Those are all really interesting viruses for good discussion later. Okay, polyhedral virus. Polyhedral is just referencing the shape. And then also here, I have my little recognition proteins. Um, these help me help the cell to say, oh, yeah, well, perhaps you do belong here. This is not a specific virus. Um, many viruses have this shape. Well, this itself is the adenovirus or adenovirus, but many viruses have this shape. Um, they are using these protein spikes for recognition. It's got its genetic material inside. It could be DNA or RNA, and it, of course, has that protein coat. Um, it mentions that that it can infect both plants, animals, or all three, plants, animals, and bacteria. But this shape is a very common shape for viruses. The other common shape is the one for the flu. Here is the adenovirus or adenovirus taken with a transmission electron microscope. So uh, a transmission electron microscope, to refresh your memory, is one that places metal flaking, um, plating on a flat two-dimensional um, specimen so that you can see it at a higher magnification. The only one stronger than that is a scanning electron microscope where it gives the three-dimensional shape of that structure. So you do the metal flaking, the coating on the three-dimensional aspect, and you can see all the way around it. This is kind of what your flu virus will look like. And I actually, um, I'm going to show you a video of it just because I know that it'll be beneficial. Uh, so an enveloped virus. I have my polyhedral capsid. But how did that virus get enveloped? I want you just to, to analyze this envelope. It's a phospholipid bilayer. How in the world did this virus get a phospholipid bilayer? It, okay, environment, and it absorbs it. Okay. Ooh. It's not random. You already know this process, especially if we've been together for a minute. When it gets to the cell membrane, it forms a vesicle. Yes. So this virus here was enveloped, and you can see that it has that phospholipid bilayer. Well, if, if you're a virus and you have these recognition proteins on the outside, you can see all of those, and then you also have a phospholipid bilayer? What? Of course you belong. We are one in the same until you hijack me and kill me. Okay? So it shows that the protein spikes extend through that membrane that help recognize, um, help the cell recognize, as well as adhere to and stick to. So this is where, I believe, yeah, I want to show you the flu virus real quick and how it works. So let's say that this guy has the flu, could be any flu, and here's a droplet from his sneeze containing, if you move in, take a look at the See, each one of those little purple things is a virus, and there are a lot of viruses floating through the air, some of which go inevitably up this unfortunate man's nose. How did that guy feel you ripped off half of his face? It was interesting because we did it while he was sleeping. <laughs> okay, I am talking with medical illustrator David Belinsky, who designed this video for Zyrus and research company. So here comes the virus, and it's going to be Here's your cells. This guy's throat cells. So notice it's covered with little yellow knobs and things. Like you, you call these keys, right? Those are the keys. Yeah. This is a key, this is a key, this is a key. Okay, if the keys on this virus happen to fit the locks, which are those little uh, purpley sticky things on the surface of the cell, if they're, they match, the cell, watch this, welcomes the virus in. And what's this? This is the welcoming committee. They all interlock with each other. What is that? And they pull this membrane down into the cell, and now it goes deeper and deeper, and that welcoming structure.
structure disperses and the virus capsule bursts and out comes the secret recipe for how to make more viruses in those little noodly things. So this Where's it going? Suspecting cell has been tricked the nucleus. The virus recipes right into its own command center, the nucleus. So in the middle. And they Nuclear are envelope. recognized by this big pink molecule which is a mini factory. Yeah, what is it doing? What's it that mini factory called? The nuclear material, the, the instruction code of the virus through one hole. Okay, it's like, it's an ace. Comes a brand new it's a ribosome. So it's, so it's inside a ribosome. After copy, after copy of virus recipes, which then go out of the nucleus to little chefs, those blue peanuts. What are those? They cook up protein. Ribosomes, they're making the proteins. Into baby viruses, and then out they go. They get covered up and head to the surface where they get new teeth, and then boom, here they come. This is an eruption of virus after virus after virus after only one virus entered the cell. But how many came out? Well, millions, millions. So if one virus could produce a million babies and do it again and again and again, how come this guy doesn't just drop? Well, because you have about 100 trillion cells, right? So a million viruses is just a drop in the bucket when you have 100 trillion cells. Anyway, remember, you do have your own immune My system. My favorite part. When it sees a virus, usually <laughs> kills it. So while the virus does multiply fast, with any luck, your immune system will work just a little faster. So, yes, viruses, all viruses, want to spread, that's what they do, but most of the time we do keep them in check. <laughs> most of the time. Sound effects totally necessary. <laughs> Does anybody know what type of cell that was? What'd you call it? White blood cell, yes. A white blood cell, yes. I thought at first second I was like, oh maybe he didn't say what I think. Yes. So I wanted you to kind of see that so that you understand how they utilize us and how they're quickly replicated. But my favorite part was that there was no medicine mentioned here because what kind of tries to outwork that virus? Your immune system. Your immune system naturally senses that there's a problem and then it'll step up its game and try to get you through it. But the typical duration is that 7 to 14 days. So at first you feel fine, and that's why when you get the flu, you feel like when you're exposed to it, you don't realize you're exposed to it. How long do you have it before you actually get sick? Usually 48 hours. That's how long it takes for it to replicate enough to suppress you. And then if you've ever gotten the flu before, you've been sitting still somewhere, or you, maybe even that morning you worked out or you did something really fun, and then like all of a sudden... You just feel like a train, like, bam. And that's whenever the viral count is outnumbering what your white blood cells can do. And so you just need to run a fever for a while, increase that metabolic process, and, and get over it. But uh, it's a process. We call it a primary exposure and secondary, but that's another lecture as well. So fun times on that. And did you not see the welcoming committee? You, and they, I realize they use very simplistic terms, but... They're referencing the exact same thing. They're just using layman language so students will learn it easier. These are my favorite viruses just because they look creepy. And if you ever watch Jimmy Neutron, not South Park, Jimmy Neutron is that science geek. Dude's pretty cool. But he had a whole episode of these marching bacteriophages, and it was really creepy. You can YouTube it because Jimmy Neutron is no longer aired. Okay, but he should be. But I, I think they maybe like South Park better than Jimmy Neutron, so I don't know. I guess it just depends on your audience. But these guys are bacteriophages. What does that tell you? They only infect bacteria. They only infect bacteria. Okay, so I have my genetic material and I have my capsid, my protein coat, but I also have this tail structure and it allows me to grasp on. And then this right here works like a needle. 
So the tails will grasp on to whatever cell it's going to infect. It'll grasp on, and then the whole virus doesn't enter. It just injects the genetic material and lets go. So it's quite creepy in its method of operation, but the, it'll latch on to a bacteria right here, and then this part right here will compress just like, like a little syringe, and it just shoots that genetic material in, and then the, uh, the whole sheath lets go. Oh, yeah, it says that right there. So just different shapes of viruses. Now, the life cycle of a virus. There are two viral life cycles. And let me, I'm going to show you a picture. All of this is in words. I'm going to say all of it. But here's the picture I want to use. The two viral life cycles, lytic and lysogenic. I added this. This was not in the notes that I found for you guys. It was just the words. And I needed something to help visualize it. Small takeaways. Lytic is the shorter word. It kills fast. Lysogenic is the longer word. It kills very slowly. Lytic infection kills the cells very quickly. Lysogenic is kind of long and drawn out. Okay. And how do you know what type of organism am I infecting here? Using context clues. How do you know I'm infecting a bacteria? The shape of the virus tells you it's a bacteriophage. What's else? What's else? Yeah. It's one cell and the circular genetic material. Look at my chromosome. It's just one circle. That one circle tells me I'm dealing with a prokaryote. Okay? The only thing that's prokaryotic on Earth is... Bacteria, right. So I'm going to start with the lytic cycle. This would be like the flu, a cold, all of that kind of thing. Um, so what initially occurs is we have a virus, a bacteriophage, attaches to a bacteria and injects its genetic material. The bacteriophage itself will then release. The viral DNA remains separate from the bacterial DNA and uses the ribosomes to make the proteins, and you can see the protein coats showing up, necessary, and then uses the Golgi, not the Golgi, I just thought of the post office. There is no Golgi apparatus in this, and how do you know that, first of all? Yeah, this is bacteria uses the cellular machinery, not any organelles, because there are no organelles, but uses the ribosomes to make the protein coats, uses the cellular machinery to construct baby viruses, and then once it's overwhelmed, the cell is overwhelmed, it immediately ruptures. And all of these baby viruses are released, and guess where they go? To infect other bacteria. This is the exact same cycle that you just saw for the flu, okay? Except for right here, I'm using a bacteriophage as opposed to the flu virus. And when we were talking about the flu, it was using ribosomes. It went into the nucleus and all of that. But that's because it was infecting a eukaryotic cell. We don't have that set up here. And we already identified the fact we're dealing with prokaryotes. So it invades the cell, uses its machinery, to create baby viruses and then lyses that cell. What happens to this cell? It's dead. Okay. This is the quick killing cycle. The long-term cycle is what we call the lysogenic cycle. It begins the exact same way. The viral DNA is injected. But instead of saying separate from it, like we see in the lytic cycle, it integrates itself into the bacterial genome. It integrates itself into the bacterial genome. And then as the bacteria goes through binary fission and it replicates its DNA, because it doesn't recognize this as being bad, it just copies the whole thing. So every single time that this cell 
replicates, it gets the good DNA along with the bad DNA. And as long as it's part of the DNA right there, the organism has the virus, they're probably just what we call asymptomatic. What does that mean? They have no symptoms. They have no symptoms. This is like HIV. These are dormant forms of viruses that can stay within you and slowly become integrated into every cell in your body. 10 years, 12 years, 15 years, people have these viruses and don't know it. And then they're, of course, propagating it. They're, they're passing it on to others. But they're remaining dormant in the cell. Now, this is all cool because you're asymptomatic, but it's all cool until the environment changes. When the environment changes, it will trigger that cell to go into like a crisis mode. Environmental changes could include temperature, could include some type of chaos, um, some type of like, something like... Like it could be a hormonal chaos, it, it, like an emotional chaos, a, a stress chaos, some type of chaos, um, temperature chaos, uh, lack of resources, like we're out of food, like something has changed in the environment and it serves as a trigger. And then every single cell that has that viral particle will immediately go into the light tick cycle. Why is that bad? Every single one of those cells will expire. When you have somebody who has had HIV for 15, 17, 20 years, and their environment changes, they become pregnant or they get the pneumonia, all of a sudden we see a rapid decline. The environment changed and it triggered the activation of that virus and slowly what's happening to their body? It's dying. And at that point, is there anything you can do? There's not. There's not. Okay, so lysogenic is where it remains dormant. And of course, I'm using a bacteria to teach this because it's very simple. But this doesn't just apply to bacterial viruses there are eukaryotic viruses that also run this same course, okay? Um, it's, if it's a virus, like the herpes virus, you have herpes, it's just not as aggressive as AIDS. So it's part of you when you're not having an outbreak, and then what does it cause, or what happens whenever something stressful occurs? You have an outbreak. You start getting sores and pustules and so on. And then once you get past that stressful time and the environment goes back, the virus goes dormant again. Okay, so that, but it's just that herpes isn't lethal. That's the difference. But it can fluctuate between lytic and lysogenic. Okay, everything I just said is on these previous slides and words. Okay. And again, it's using a bacteria for teaching purposes. <clears throat> Unenveloped viruses. What do you think that means? It's a virus that shows up with no envelope. So the whole virus itself is taken in through endocytosis, and it's giving examples. Herpes, chickenpox, HIV, influenza, just the same process that we saw there. The whole virus is taken in. The virus directs the synthesis of new viruses, and then what happens to that cell? That cell is used, and then the viruses will leave that cell in order to do what? Did it kill that cell, the one in the video? No. It just used the cell. Is that cell as strong as it was before it got there? No. Could it recover? Yes. Could it also expire? Yes. But does it really matter to us if it's just one or two cells? 
It even said in that video, it can be up to a million cells and it not really have an impact on you. Okay? You already know how we acquire the envelope, but again, through the process of exocytosis, which we saw in that video, the viral particle comes up to the cell membrane and the cell membrane just forms an envelope around it as it's exiting. That is very different from what we studied previously because during exocytosis we would say that the vesicle fused with that plasma membrane. This is different. It's taking a piece of that cell membrane with it. Along with that cell membrane it gets the keys and those keys are those recognition proteins so that it can invade another cell shortly after. Okay, so we've talked about the plasma membrane and the formation of vesicles and all of that. Anyone confused right now or need clarification? Yes. So how is it able to do that? It's like, because of other things in the cell, they're there. So this is a virus, and it has reprogrammed that cell specifically. So where did it, where was the first place it went once it got into the cell? The nucleus. So her question was, how does it get it to do that? And the reality is, is that because that cell has been hijacked, it's been told to read a different message, so it doesn't act as it's supposed to. Good question. Okay, pathogenic viruses. A pathogen is a disease-causing agent, so a pathogenic virus is one that causes a disease. Okay? Some viruses can cause death, and I don't think that you're, you didn't realize that. Okay? Some just cause you to get really sick, um, maybe some inflammation, swelling, redness, fever, discomfort. But once it runs its course, you know, you're better. Some can even alter gene function, which can definitely, because if it's a virus and it's not living, it has the ability to mutate very easily with no repercussions for the virus itself. And so if that mutation infects your cell and it's a negative mutation, it could definitely lead to cancer or other issues. A latent phase, a latent phase is analogous to lysogenic. What does that mean? It can remain dormant. And look at the terms it uses. The, re the virus can remain in the cell in an inactive form until triggered to become something active. What type of trigger am I talking about? Not necessarily a mutation. Environment. Environmental changes. That, again, that can be an infection, fever, um, weather changes, severe weather changes, uh, stress, puberty, anything that could change the environment in which that cell is functioning. And it mentions here, it's similar to the lysogenic cycle. Most viral infections are asymptomatic. So is the lysogenic cycle only in bacteria? Lysogenic cycle is reference for bacteria, but if you continue in your research, like when we ta taught it here, I taught it to you in bacteria. But like you know how I said you'll go on. HIV is lysogenic. Like, so it infects in the same manner, and, in, and it can also infect bacteria. But HIV is not a bacteriophage. So that's why I said it's analogous to that, because I knew that it was using that language here. His question was, is lysogenic just specific to bacteria? And the true answer is no, but that's how it's taught in this chapter. Like, if you go on to search um, viruses, you can type in, what are some examples of lysogenic viruses? Or what are some examples of lytic viruses? and they will give you a list. So it's just being taught here, and, and we used a bacteria, and again, I asked you how we knew it was a bacteria. Those were things, indicators I wanted to point out to you. Very good question. Okay, viruses enter plant cells. The difference between infecting an animal and a plant cell is that plant cells have cell walls, yes, okay? And the method of transmission, like for animal viruses, it could be in the air, it could be in fluids, it could be by touch. 
For plant viruses, it could be that an insect got it for, has the virus or has a form of a virus or took it when it ate part of that plant and carries it to another one. So it could be by animal transmission. It could be, and, and worms and caterpillars all fall into animal transmission. It could be pollen transmission, meaning this plant had the virus and it sprayed its sperm everywhere. So the sperm has the virus and whatever, wherever that pollen lands, it's going to infect that plant. So that's what it's talking about. So that would be wind transmission through pollen. It can be transmitted in seeds if that seed came from a plant infected with the virus. But overall, plant viruses will only infect plants. Yes. Okay. Um, and again, it talks about the replication cycle. And it's the same type of replication cycle. Gives you some more examples of um, plant viruses. Why are viruses so difficult to treat? Because they're not alive, okay? They, are, they cannot be treated with antibiotics. They are subject to random mutations because there's no proofreading, there's no living organism, and if they do re mutate, and let's say, so let's say you have flu A, and then you get over flu A, and you have the antibodies for flu A, but just a few weeks later, you get flu B. The difference between flu A and flu B are the keys that are on the surface. You're going to get just as sick with flu B, even though you've already had flu A. Flu B is different genetically than flu A. So you have antibodies for flu A, but not for flu B. Once you get a virus, because it integrates itself, it leaves a little tag in your genetic material, you don't get that exact same virus again because your body builds antibodies to it. If that virus mutates in any way, shape, or form, then you can be re-exposed to a different form of that virus. So like, for example, chicken pox, although many of you probably haven't had chicken pox, when I was little, you had to get chicken pox. So because at that point they didn't understand, you know, how it was working and they wanted to make sure that you got it young. So you didn't, we knew that if you got it when you were old, it was a much more severe form of the virus. So I remember being in kindergarten and I don't know the kid's name, but the kid got chicken pox and it was like everybody was in so-and-so's group and all the parents were notified that there was chicken pox in the classroom and we all got it. And, you know, we didn't know. We were, don't itch, don't itch, don't itch. So we all got chicken pox. But we are not at risk for the severe form of shingles that occurs in adulthood because we've already been exposed to the virus early on. Okay? So I don't know that any of you have had chicken pox, especially those younger ones, because I know, like, my kids haven't had chicken pox. And some of you are, like, I could be your mom. But... Uh, we, I don't want to say that we have it eradicated, because we don't, which means it's not in existence anymore, but it's much more under control than it was whenever I was little. Those antiviral drugs will only be effective if you take it early on in that viral reproductive process. Once that virus has been given a chance to, to take fleet or take flight, it's been in there seven or eight days, there's no point in you trying to fight it. Your immune system will eventually overcome it. When do we think viruses showed up? Hypo hypothetically, we believe that they probably showed up after cells did, and they just evolved from fragments of DNA or RNA. Whatever frag a fragment of DNA is a gene, and a gene is used to make proteins. So when you put all that together and you understand the process of protein synthesis, this all kind of makes sense if there's just fragments of DNA. Can it carry out all the metabolic processes? No, because it just has one or two genes. Or, I mean, it could have more than that, of course. But it cannot sustain life on its own. So we believe that viruses came after cells. Viroids. Viroids, um, it mentions them here being for plants. 
no coat, strands or circles of RNA. They're not full viruses, okay? But what they do is, it mentions here, they activate protein kinases. So kinases, we already know, are enzymes because we know that there's an ACE there. So they're supposed to, to facilitate a reaction, either speed it up or slow it down. But ultimately, it reduces the rate of protein synthesis. So this makes that organism look, over time, it makes it look sick um, or like deficient in something, weak, okay? If that viroid continues, to, like using plant crops for an example, if it continues to spread, it could wipe out an entire crop. So um, especially those farmers who their whole livelihood is based on the, the farming of, of a specific crop, they're very, very protective of them. Prions. Prions are proteinaceous infectious agents. And you can kind of see where prion um, was derived from. There's no DNA or RNA here. These are only protein-based. And all prions, so far, as far as what we're discussing here, and so far as my familiarity, attack your nervous system. <clears throat> so what they are are proteins that didn't fold the way they were supposed to fold. So that means it changed its what? Shape or structure. And so as a result, it changed its function. So these began to deteriorate. And in every example that I'm going to show you here, it was a, a nervous system de deterioration. Okay, And it mentions thank you, the, the scientists responsible for discovering it. Scrappy mad cow disease, which is also BSE. So bovine spongiform encephalopathy. Encephalo tells you it has to do with the brain. Crutchfield's Jacobs disease, Kuru. These are all brain disorders that once you get them, they're very aggressive, and the individual normally expires as a result of that. So these are just misfolded proteins that change their shape, and as a result of having a different shape, it was a negative function, and it began to de deteriorate the, the nervous system of these organisms. Okay? So um, also... If you had an organism that had this, I don't know how many of you remember when mad cow, you might have been little when this happened, when mad cow disease went out, like when that was a big deal, they took like beef off, the, like you couldn't buy beef anywhere. Um, if, if you ate beef that came from the farm, like they had you, they were like, they tracked you down using the skews on the, the um, you know what I'm talking about, barcodes on your foods to, to have you tested because it was protein in nature and not viral in nature, because if you consumed it, guess what you got? Yeah, you got it. And, and cows are mammals. Now they're a specific species, but, and, and we didn't get it at, to the exact same extent, but there were issues where people were getting these conditions as a result of consuming foods that had those prions. So um, prions themselves are similar in nature to, to, to viruses, I guess, in the fact that they are not living on their own. But um, they are different. They have no genetic material. They are just a misfolded protein. Okay, so showing you that. And it's the end of chapter this one. I think this is 26. Bacteria, archaea bacteria, and viruses are at the end.